Hello, my name is Paul Bizanti and with me today is Cole Squire of the People's Party of Canada. We're having a series of fireside chats with the federal election candidates for the 2021 federal election. And uh, this marks the commencement of the 2021-2022 Chamber TV series, where we focus on issues in the Brantford Brant community uh, as it affects the business community. And uh, we're, we're happy to be joined today and give you uh, a, an opportunity to, to talk with our, our candidate here. And uh, um, thank you, Cole, for, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Paul, for having me. I'm happy to share more about myself and to show more about the People's Party of Canada. Excellent. Excellent. It's, it's, uh, it's great to get to meet you. And Cole, uh, not many Canadians know what it's like to grow up on the reserve. Uh, in what ways would you say that's shaped your outlook on life and, and your upbringing and, and your outlook on politics? Well, growing up on the reserve, um, because we're in such a close-knit community a lot, there's um, a, lot, a lot of shared culture and values strongly in our First Nations communities, especially Six Nations. Fortunately, um, I grew up very close with my family and whatnot, so we had a very f strong family bond with um, everyone uh, growing up there. I was born at the Brantford General Hospital here, so I, uh, in my early years, I did grow up in Brantford briefly. I, I don't remember those years too much, right. but since then, we've uh, been back out on the Six Nations Reserve. I did uh, come back to Brantford while I was working at the Brantford General Hospital briefly, so right now I'm back at home while I'm finishing school, and... Uh, Go, yeah, like growing up on the reserve, it, there was competing worldviews I'd find. There was a lot mm. of people who appreciated and wanted to continue to safeguard and uphold the more traditional aspects of our, of our reservation and our culture. And there's also an, another faction that just are kind of more modernized, so to say, that are more focused on, I guess, just day-to-day uh, -day life, whether they're going to work, looking after their families. So... I guess growing up, there's like a bit of a clash between the traditional uh, Confederacy Council on the reserve, and this isn't just uh, privy to Six Nations, but there's a clash between those councils and sure. the, the new band councils that we see to administering a lot of programs and services on the reserve. Right. So it was interesting, uh, there's a bit of polarization there growing up, but um, it's, it was a good place to call home, and it's uh, great to be able to not only represent Brantford Brant, but also the people from Six Nations and New Credit Reserve, which are also in our riding. Yeah, and, and that's a, a good lead into the, the next point. Like we, we have 160,000 people in this riding. It's an extremely diverse riding here. Now, I don't think a lot of people outside Brantford recognize that. So in, in your capacity, if, if, if you are elected to represent this riding, um, what motivates you to, to, to run and represent uh, the, the hugely diverse uh, group of citizens that they call Brantford Brant, the uh, Six Nations and the, the New Credit Reserve Home. Yeah, um, we see when you're in a position such as being a federal member of parliament, you got to make sure that you're being careful and in your actions and what you're doing to represent your entire riding or your community as best you can. I don't want to be catering or pandering to any specific groups, regardless if it's uh, a political groups or different ethnic groups like that. Uh, myself and the People's Party of Canada want to make sure we're making the best decisions for everyone in Canada and making sure that everyone is able to prosper and live the life to the fullest and the best that they possibly can. So I've uh, had those two different experiences. I have uh, grew up on the reserve and I've also went to school and worked in Brantford. So being able to just talk to people on all different levels, whether it's um, educational backgrounds, socioeconomic, things like that, being able to actually listen and communicate with the people that you're representing and serving and being able to take actionable uh, solutions both locally and to Ottawa. Yeah. Now, uh, it's, it's, no, it's no secret that we're coming out of this pandemic. Hopefully we're coming out of this pandemic. Um, it, with respect to the, the local economy in, in, in this riding, what would you say are the, the two or three biggest challenges to local businesses in, in coming out of this pandemic? Well, I, I hope we're coming out of the pandemic because they they're forever moving the goalposts on this. Uh, one of the first things we need to do, we need to have an attainable exit out of this current situation that we're in. We can't keep shifting the goalposts on our on when we're going to come out of this situation safely. At first, we were doing the lockdowns to stop the curve. 
we were waiting for the vaccinations to roll out. Once they rolled out, we were hoping for a 70% attainment rate, and we've now surpassed that, and now we're now trying to push it and push it forward. Now, the CFIB, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses, during the last lockdowns this past winter came out and said there's up to 200,000 businesses across Canada that face permanent closure and bankruptcy if we do not take a more rational approach to what's been happening with COVID-19. So one of the things we need to do is we need to get people back to work safely. We've had the personal protective equipment to keep workers and uh, their customers safe, whether it's the plexiglass barriers, the face masks, now the vaccinations. So in my opinion, with all of these measures that are supposed to be making people safer, and being able to get us out of this situation. I don't know why the government, whether provincial or federal, are trying to prolong this situation. We, we cannot do it anymore. Even now with the government paying people with the Canadian response benefit to stay home, we're now seeing employee shortages, which are just very devastating to our economy right now. We have uh, local businesses that are having to reduce hours or actually close their business because we don't have the people to work right now. People are more comfortable staying at home whether it's they actually have various uh, serious concerns about the pandemic or if they're just finding it easier to sit home and collect money from the government. This is extremely harmful to our economy and our, it's just going to, if we don't get out of this now, we're going to see serious disruptions to our supply chain and our economy as a country in a whole. We're, we're in record federal debt right now. We're $1.5 trillion in debt. The current sp spending we're seeing from Ottawa is not only indebting Canadians, it's indebting our children right now. So we need to take a more rational approach to dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic and our fiscal policies in general so that we're living within our means and also leaving this country in very good shape for our future generations that are coming in. So as, as you were alluding to, uh, you, you drive around town, you pick up the classifieds, there's help wanted notices everywhere. How do you get people back to work? How do you, uh, what steps would a federal government uh, take to get people back into those work? Uh, and a lot of those people into uh, the work that has been disrupted by uh, COVID-19 restrictions. Well, like I said, we need to take a rational approach to this and one that's actually attainable and has the means out of it. And the People's Party of Canada has a approach that will do just that. We'll continue to make sure that we're looking after and protecting the people that are most vulnerable. We've seen an exponential amount of uh, deaths from this pandemic that were happening in our long-term care facilities and people that were facing um, other types of health conditions too. The general population in Canada, they, we see cases in the news all the time, but we're not seeing the deaths, which is a really positive thing. People are coming down with this virus. They're able to recover from it, especially our children. Their immune systems are great at fighting these things off and even Merck the pharmaceutical giant that was researching trying to implement a COVID-19 vaccination they found they did a study and they found out that people had that acquired natural that went through natural infection and acquired natural immunity had better immune responses to this virus than people that were taking these vaccinations so for the good majority of Canadians you don't need to be as concerned about this if when it comes to the masking and whatnot if you want to wear a mask in your workplace or your educational place to feel safe and to feel like you're doing what you can to reduce your risk that's all the power to you you should be able to make that decision but these other people too that have other health conditions like asthma or have had a history of cancer and people that have been trying to request medical exemptions from their doctors and they haven't been able to get them, they're being forced to wear these face coverings as well. And th this should never be a mandate at all. It should be left to recommendation level and it should be up to Canadians to make their own informed decisions on their health status and what they're going to do to protect their health. The same way, the same applies to these vaccines as they roll out now. It's, it's unprecedented what's going on in Canada with these vaccine passports and I have very serious concerns with that. So, and then tying it back to getting people out there, we need to stop paying people to not work and not return to their jobs and start reversing these, this ridiculous amount of spending we're seeing happening right now. Like I said, uh, people are finding it easier to sit home and collect these benefits. And that, that can't continue on right now. We need to start making sure that our businesses can reopen safely, stay open, and we need to support our medium and uh, small and medium businesses so that they're not going under. The government right now is uh, 
they're trying to help help these businesses by giving them these loans and other subsidies to deal mm -hmm. with the loss of revenue and that's a temporary fix yes it's helping them being able to pay their bills at the end of the day but any business to be able to pay those loans back you have to stay open and you have to be able to make that revenue and that income to be able to keep your business afloat pay your employees and if we're continuing to be shut down with these lockdowns and other restrictions coming out this is going to do them in they're not going to be able to pay back these loans so mm -hmm. we need to take a rational approach as i said and let businesses decide what measures they want to do to protect themselves and their employees and their consumers the government needs to put out recommendations and do what they can to offer assistance but the the top-down approach has been very detrimental so on on the topic of, of public health and the economy uh, particularly in 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 Brantford and, and surrounding areas uh, we have seen the impacts of the opioid epidemic dramatically impact uh, not just the businesses that operate downtown but the individuals who call downtown home as well and as much as this is a, a social issue it's also an economic one in that it, it has uh, a, a, a vast impact to to a lot of different sectors uh, what would a, a PPC-led government do to try and, and tackle the, the opioid crisis uh, locally and, and across the nation? Yeah, it's, it's really concerning. If you drive downtown Brantford, uh, there's historically a lot of beautiful buildings down there. And with uh, the, the local universities and colleges trying to revamp our downtown core, we're still seeing this huge issue with homelessness and drugs in our community. So it's actually not too attractive for businesses to be able to continue operating down there or to attract uh, customers or consumers to the area. And it's extremely heartbreaking when you drive downtown and you see the people on the sides of the roads either passed out or rocking back and forth. They're going to, through types of withdrawals or symptoms from this type of activity they're doing. and. It's, it's, it's really multifaceted. There's no real one solution to this. Mm. I know some people want to try to end the stigma with op opioid, cr opioid crises. And that's, that's not a real solution in my opinion. We need to continue making sure these people are able to get the help they need and the services to come off of these drugs and to re reclaim their lives and their power back. When you're trying to normalize this or end the stigma with the opioids, opioids, I can't say that word, it's, uh, it's not doing anything beneficial. And then some of these municipalities I've seen like out west in Vancouver, their approach is to try to give these people regulated access to these drugs. And it just makes no sense in my opinion. Like if, you were, if you're going to Alcoholics Anonymous, you're not going there to, for happy hour at five o'clock to get drinks there. You're going to get counseling and the support services you need to be able to overcome these addictions. So there's that approach we need to, we need to make sure that the people that are actually suffering with these addictions are able to get the help they need and that we are not gonna normalize this type of activity in, or behavior in our society. Our children in our community do not need to see their parents or other people succumbing to these uh, life-changing addictions that put them out of work. They disrupt their uh, ability to earn an income or be able to have a home. So like I said, that's one approach that the PPC will be taking is to try to get people the help that they need to overcome these addictions, as I said. And the other thing we need to do is we need to crack down on the crime and the trafficking of these drugs. It's um, there's a, a lot of uh, drug smuggling and stuff that's bringing these drugs into our borders. They're spreading these out throughout our communities. And it's, it's, it's really tragic to see how some people just succumb to this. And it's not, like I said, there's so many ways to approach this issue. Like even a lot of people, they don't, get hooked onto these drugs by hanging out with uh, in the downtown core per se it comes from the pharmaceutical industry too so we need mm -hmm. to make sure that we're um, stopping any type of uh, I guess backhanded or uh, underground activity where people are selling their prescriptions when they're not using them once they're completed with whatever painkillers they're getting so there needs to be some type of uh, solution to make sure that we're trying to get these drugs off of our streets. We've seen what happened with um, the legalization of cannabis. That's, that's, that's one thing for people to go and to participate in that, 
to be able to have that regulated access to a product like that. But when you're trying to compare people's approach with using cannabis versus opioids, it's it's uh, two stark realities that need to be addressed. Like it's it's one thing to have people being able to purchase cannabis, like I said, but when you're facing with these other types of addictions that are much more detrimental, uh, they're more addictive, and they're very harmful to our community. So we need to, there's multiple approaches that we'll look at sure. the PPC to be able to address these issues as best we can. And it's not just a federal level, this needs to be addressed at the local municipality level and the provincial level as well. So you touched on it a couple of times in there. Uh, there's often a correlation between uh, the individuals who are struggling with an opioid addiction and uh, a lack of avail availability of, of uh, reliable, safe and affordable housing for them. Uh, housing is an, another crisis in, in Canada right now. Uh, what does uh, the PPC platform do to address uh, housing availability and affordability in, in Canada and, and again locally focused here on Brantford Brant? Well, uh, an another multifaceted approach we need to take. We need to um, address our federal debt situation we're having right now. As I said, we're borrowing money that we're not able to pay back immediately. We're the only uh, G7 nation that lost our AAA credit rating over this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we need to reduce inflation. We need to be balancing our budget. We need to return to having a balanced budget. And these other parties, whether it's the Liberals, Conservatives, the Greens or the NDP, they're, they're throwing money around trying to buy votes. They're trying to cater to special interest groups or they're trying to find uh, sell their platforms by making these promises that they're not going to be able to uphold. And if they do uphold them, they're still going to continue to tank our country, our economy, and our, f and our deficit. So in terms of addressing that, like the, the cost of living right now, like with the inflation and these, the deficit we're in, it's f impacting the cost of living, whether it's the housing market, the groceries that are Canadians are struggling to buy, the fuel prices. So that's one approach we need to take. And then we also need to return back to, uh, we need to address some of the issues with the supply and demand of housing. We need to create the right economic climate for uh, people to be able to return to either building private homes or we're seeing, or we need to increase ways for housing projects to continue to take place so that people have those homes. And in Brantford, Brant, we've seen a lot of development in the housing market, which is great. But again, these prices right now, they're astronomical. It's unattainable for many hardworking Canadians to be able to have the, the j hopes or dreams to ever own their own family home. So with the, with the increase in the housing development, we're seeing the prices aren't there. And then it's also clogging up our infrastructure, like our, our roads. They're not able to keep up with the increase in demand. So we'll do at the federal level what we can to help promote the right environment and to create some innovation at the municipal and provincial level. But this is something that needs to be addressed by all levels of government. We need to make sure that we're, we're able to get the housing demand caught up or with the supply. And the other thing that the People's Party of Canada has taken a strong stance on, which is uh, probably one of the reasons people will like to refer to us as a racist party, which is not the case, is with anything with supply and demand, when the demand is hot, but the supply is not, the housing price, the housing market, for example, is going to go up a bit. Mm -hmm. So with right now, we're seeing, um, we're bringing in a lot of people into our country. We are at, at, at subscribed to the United Nations Global Compact on Migration. So it's not only our country that's t um, dictating or trying to figure out how many people we're going to bring in. We're now relying on this foreign unelected body to tell us what we need to do in terms of bringing in immigrants and refugees and that's that's not uh that's not sustainable right now we're seeing people up towards the 350,000 newcomers coming into canada and that's that's things we want we want to continue to uh sh share the unique values and our culture in canada with people who want to come in that want to respect and participate in our society and right now it's, it's kind of at our detriment. We need to have a more sustainable approach to immigration. The People's Party of Canada, in my opinion, has the most pro-immigration policy out there because we want to 
re reduce back on the level of people we're bringing in every year to a more sustainable level to about 100, 150,000 a year. And we will continue to uh, move those margins depending on the economic climate and the needs for workers in our country. But by doing that, we are going to reduce the tax burden on Canadians so that they're able to save some of their hard-earned taxpayers' dollars and that's also going to give some room for the housing market to catch up and adjust for that. So like I said, we need to create the right opportunities for more housing to get out there so that we can continue welcoming people into our country that want to share our share in our society and our values and our culture here. And right now, it's just not working out. If you look at um, Toronto or Vancouver, these are some of the most unaffordable places to live in terms of housing. And when we're bringing in people into our country right now, over 41% of them are settling down in these areas. So you can see the correlation with the cost of living, whether it's at the housing market, as we're discussing right now, versus this huge influx of people we're bringing in. So we need to take a more rational approach to this. It's, it's um, it, of course, being Canadians, we want to help other people mm -hmm. in their time of need. But we need to also be responsible in making sure that it's not to our citizens' detriment and that they're able to re we're able to reduce these costs of living. That's that's interesting, and um, as, along with housing and and support of of that industry, uh, reductions in in immigration, as you were saying, to to make maybe a more sustainable approach to housing availability. Uh, a, another key piece is the public infrastructure spending. Uh, what does the, the People's Party of Canada uh, consider a, a reasonable approach to infrastructure spending, um, maybe either as an economic stimulus coming out of this pandemic or as an ongoing responsibility of the federal government? Well, in, t in terms of uh, infrastructure spending and allocations in the federal budget, uh, we want to continue taking care of our citizens in our country first. Right now, there the, the level of taxation we have in our country is astronomical. We have some of the highest um, income tax rates in any developed nation. And a lot of our Canadians' money that they're working for is actually leaving our country, it's leaving our borders. And that's not going, when it's leaving our country, it's not able to go back into our communities for the things we need like infrastructure. So the People's Party of Canada, we want to, as I said, return to balanced budgets. We want to lower uh, some of the costs for Canadian taxpayers and some of the ways we're going to do that while still maintaining to achieve a balanced budget is over the course of one mandate we're going to gradually reduce the current corporate tax rate from 15% down to 10% and that's going to save Canadian businesses and entrepreneurs upwards of $9.5 billion a year. So that's savings that businesses are going to able, be able to redirect into things such as um, increasing the wages of their employees, putting that money back into their communities, or uh, putting it into research and development to improve innovation and productivity. So that's going to create more opportunities for businesses to grow and to continue bring it back. The government doesn't need to be the ones necessarily taking everyone's money, whether it's uh, public or private sector, and then trying to address these issues. We need to reduce the size of government and bring it back locally as much as we can. And the other thing the People's Party of Canada will do is over the course of a mandate is we'll gradually reduce the uh, personal gains tax from 50% down to zero. That's going to save Canadian taxpayers another $7 billion. So when we're trying to cut wasteful spending, we're not doing it at the detriment of hardworking Canadians that rely on some of the social programs we're seeing. It's more of the wasteful spending and the ridiculous policies in place right now that are inhibiting businesses from being able to grow and that's taking money out of Canadian taxpayers' pockets. Interesting. Um, one of the one of the things on you talk a lot about uh, tax reform and creating a more competitive environment for uh, Canadian businesses. Uh, right now, one of the one of the concerns out there with a lot of the the climate targets uh, for 2050 is how do we address those climate targets while not creating such a, a non-competitive environment for domestic businesses. Uh, what, what thoughts do you have on that? Well, uh, I'll get right to it. The People's Party of Canada, we, don't, we plan to abolish the federal carbon tax right now. This is an extremely ludicrous approach to trying to deal with any issues of climate or the environment. 
We're seeing um, the cost of living increase for some of the hardest working people in our country. 40% of people in Ontario that are already struggling to get by are paying more in carbon taxes than they're able to get back in rebates. This is um, increasing the cost of living through groceries because we need the fuel to be able to transport these products and services around. It's costing Canadians more at the pump when they're trying to get to their work. And it's uh, raising the cost to be able to heat your homes in Canada as well. So we need to continue taking actual attainable measures and solutions to protect our environment. As I said, myself being a First Nations person, that's one of our cultural foundations, is living in harmony and balance with nature. We need to continue protecting our green spaces and other uh, sacred grounds within our country, but we also need to take a more rational approach when it comes to dealing with climate. Taxing carbon, an essential element for life on Earth, is not doing anything to control or change the course of our, our, our planet's climate. It's continued to change throughout history and it will continue to do so. We just need to learn to adapt with it and to be able to continue uh, making sure we're protecting the environment, but not at the detriment where it's um, imposing these ridiculous taxes on businesses and Canadians too. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think uh, I think a lot of times it's it's difficult to understand the the complex nature of these things, and that one thing doesn't always uh, have no effect on something else if you change it. So it's uh, it, it's good to have a dialogue about the the complexity of these issues and and how each things. Uh, sort of interact with each other. So uh, I, I definitely want to thank you, Cole, for coming out today. Uh, I appreciate the, the time you've taken to interact with our viewers. We hope that for the business community as well as the individuals who are watching this, uh, got a sense of, of who you are, uh, what your priorities are, how you would represent the riding, as well as uh, the platform of, of your, your party. So thank you very much for thank coming Thank you, Paul, out. for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, best of luck on the campaign trail, and thank you. Uh, we'll see you soon. Perfect. Sounds good. Thanks.